Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to CT Hope Online. We're about to get started in just a couple of minutes, so grab a cup of coffee, get your family around the TV, get in the chat. Our hosts are here to help you, and we are going to get going with another great Sunday at Hope Church. We'll see you soon.
Hi, Hoop Church. We miss you. Love the Donnellys. We miss you, Hope Church family. Love the Colts. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to cthope.online. My name is Tom, and I am the executive pastor here at Hope Church, and I am so glad that you decided to join us today, especially if you've joined us for the first time. We hope that you have an awesome experience, that you leave here encouraged today. For all of you, let us know you're here. Go on to the chat. Let us know your name, maybe where you're even watching from. And by the way, we have online hosts that are here to take care of you. If you have any questions at all, let them know and they'll be sure to help you. Also, they are available to pray with you. If you would like prayer or have a prayer request this morning that's on your heart, make sure you click that live prayer button. You'll enter a kind of a private room where they are able to, um, to pray with you this morning. If you are watching and you want to give us a shout out on social media, make sure you send your picture and your family watching or whatever. Hashtag that at CT Hope Church. We have programming for kids today. Uh, you just go to our website at cthope.com or click the link right here on this page and your kids can enjoy a personal online experience as well. So don't forget to check that out. Before we sing another song and before Pastor Dan comes to finish up this series that we're doing today, uh, why don't we all pray together this morning? Join me. Dear God, thank you so much for the opportunity that we have this morning to be here. And no, we are not in a building, God, but you have said in your word where two or three are gathered in your name, you are in our midst. And God, we are gathered here today in your name and we know you are here. Uh, you are powerful and you want to help us in our lives. I pray that for a few minutes that we would put the distractions aside, that we're able to focus in on what you would have for us today, and that once we uh, hit the power button off, God, uh, that it would not stop there, but that we would take that into our day, into our week, um, and that we would just completely be open to what you have to say for us today. I thank you for everyone who has joined us. I pray blessing over them. And Lord, we give this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hope Church, how you doing? Good to see you all again. Hey, listen, let's just hit this right out front. Online church is a totally different experience for many of us. Uh, and, and we don't get that opportunity to physically get together and give a hug or go to get some coffee and our 2,500 creamers that we have out there that you can select from. And uh, we don't get that same experience. But uh, I, want, I just want to say I appreciate that so many of you have continued to try to stay connected at Hope through online church. You've uh, interacted with people through the chat. You've dropped emails. You've uh, sought to stay committed to the community here. Uh, if you are tuning in for maybe the first time, my name is Dan. I am the teaching pastor here. And the last few weeks we've been going through a series called The Waiting is the Hardest Part. We are all in a period of waiting. And that brings up a lot of frustrations and tensions and struggles as we've talked about these last few weeks. We're going to talk about another today. We've tried to look at all of these uh, problems through the lens of something called the Stockdale Paradox. And that is that we confront the brutal realities of what we are going through. We don't try to minimize it. We don't try to have a Pollyanna attitude and say, oh, it's all going to be good and, that, and so on. We confront it. But at the same time, we aren't depressed by it because we try to make sure that this is going to become a defining moment of our lives. We are going to overcome this. We are going to persevere and make it through. This is important for us to get this mindset, especially as we wrap up our series today. Now, Sean Baker lost her job in 2016. For many years in Houston, she had worked at a gas company and faithful you know, to the company, worked hard and so on, and she was laid off. And this was traumatizing for her and her husband. They didn't know what they were going to do. And as she's dealing with all the emotions of losing her job, her and her husband were out uh, having dinner one day in town, and they were near an old bar, and they, they saw the old bar being cleared out of old furniture, and of course, the people that were clearing it out were just like chucking it into the dumpster and being rough with it and uh, so on. And Sean, in that moment, had an epiphany. She said, that's it. She told her husband, that is our new company. And so, in 2016, Tantrums LLC was born. Now, what is Tantrums LLC? See, here's what they did. They went and they set up rooms. They called them rage rooms. And they got old furniture and they set them up in these rage rooms. And for uh, a little bit of an amount of money, 30, 40 bucks, you could go in for 10 to 15 minutes with a lead pipe, a baseball bat, a golf club. And for that time, beat everything up. You can destroy everything in that room. You've got permission. You paid the money. And so their company started. And guess what? It was wildly successful business people parents, uh, you name it, everyone went in there, teams went in there just to get some tension and frustration out of their system and beat up on some old couches and TVs and so on. I don't know about you, that sounds like an incredible business opportunity right now, and I don't know, maybe some of you need to do Tantrums LLC in Connecticut, but uh, I think many of us are dealing, if not all of us, are dealing with a level of frustration. That's really our reality right now, is frustration, because we don't have control the reality of everything right now is that we have frustration because we do not have control of what is going on. We're not in charge. Now, this has been especially difficult for those of you who are planners and those of you that like to be in charge of things. If you know the Enneagram personalities, this is the type 1 and the type 8. This is tough for you. You cannot control what's going on. You cannot make the government change their position on what we should be doing. You cannot make a business open up. You can protest and all of that, but the reality is, is you don't have control. You can't plan out for this. For my planners, the biggest waste of money that you and I had because I am a planner was buying a daytimer this year. Boy, if I could get that money back, that would have been fantastic. But uh, we are frustrated because we don't have control of the situation. Now, some of us are frustrated for many different reasons. Some of us are frustrated because we cannot 
uh, playing out anything. We're sort of in the waiting game still. Uh, now, in Connecticut, we have May 20th, and we know that some businesses are going to start opening up, and things are going to be great with that, at least a little bit better than what they have been. But we still, once again, cannot force something to open up that we wanted to. Some of us are frustrated because we can't go to our favorite restaurant, <laughs> Um, the Inishmore Pub in Colchester, we can't go there. I, I've been dying for some corned beef from that place, and, and I can't make them open up. They are at the control of what the officials tell us in the state. Uh, you, you may be frustrated because you can't control the fact that schools are not going to reopen until fall, most likely. And now you are full-time homeschool parent. Um, maybe if you don't have children, maybe you're not married or whatever, you're just frustrated that you can't go to a movie with your friends. I, whatever it is, frustration is our reality, and we can't do anything about it. We don't have control. And some of us look for something to control in a time like this. We begin to fix things around the house that we you know, have not bothered with for 15 years, but now... All of a sudden, we need control of something. Sometimes we try to control friends, control our children. We're looking for control some way. We have to have control to feel like we have some power in this moment. And that frustration that we have because we don't have control oftentimes leads to one of two areas. One, we talked about rage. <laughs> it leads to just absolute rage. We're angry, we're frustrated. The other place it leads is apathy, where we just are so frustrated, we just quit. We walk away. We give up. I don't know which one you struggle with the most, but I think many of you, if you have not gone through this, are on the brink of rage or apathy. Now, this is a great time for us to talk about a defining moment because I want this to be a defining moment. The problem is, is that that frustration is an opponent of that defining moment. And that's what our big idea is this morning, is that frustration is the opponent of a defining moment. What if, what if, that's the point though. What if the frustration we're feeling is the point of this whole thing that we're going through, that it is beginning to reveal things in us that we did not know about ourselves or maybe we needed to confront. Maybe this frustration that we're feeling and the lack of control and not being able to do anything about it is telling us something deeper about ourselves or deeper about our relationship with God. Today we're going to take a look at a psalm that I just recently came back across. And uh, let me set it up by telling you the background. David uh, is dealing with uh, his enemies. King David from the Old Testament uh, He's dealing with a lot of enemies, and he's frustrated because it seems like his enemies are winning, and he is on the losing end. In Psalm chapter 13, David vents to God. It's a short psalm, but a powerful psalm, especially with how some of us are feeling today. We're going to pick up at verse 1 of Psalm 13. David says this, How long, Lord? I could stop right there. Because some of you have said that a couple times today, possibly. How long is this going to go on? David goes on, he says, Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? David, at the very beginning of this, feels forgotten. He feels God has totally forgotten about him. And he's hiding somewhere. And you very well may know what that feels like. You may very well be there today. And that's what frustrates you, is it seems like God just doesn't care. He's not intervening on this. I've been praying hard. I've been doing everything I'm supposed to, and nothing is changing. Do you even care, God, that my business might close? Do you even care that I'm trying to balance a job and teaching my kids? God, do you even care about my mental state right now as I am struggling in this being alone? Do you care, God? David knew what it felt like. He goes on in verse 2, he says, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and day after day have sorrow in my heart? The worst part about this, as we talked about last week, is sometimes this feels like solitary confinement. We are stuck 
and we can't do anything about it, and our thoughts just replay in our head, and we have thoughts that are not healthy. And David says, how long do I have to deal with these thoughts, God? How long? And, and I have sorrow in my heart. The word sorrow in my heart here, he's actually using uh, the word that's talking about emotional distress. He has emotional distress because it seems God doesn't care, God is not near, and he's going to be waiting forever. And verse 3 says, Look on me and answer, Lord my God. Give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. He says, you know what? This basically, God, it looks like you're not even looking on me. In the verse before, he says, how long will my enemies triumph over me? It seems like his enemies are having triumph over me and God is just looking the other way. He's like, are you going to check me out? What's going on here, God? Uh, you may have to identify what your enemy is right now. Is it COVID-19? Is it just being out of control? Maybe it's yourself. But whatever it is, it feels like it's winning and you are not. And so David knew when it felt like to have an enemy that it seemed was having the upper hand and he was being left behind by God. It says, you know, look on me, God, and answer me. Uh, give light to my eyes or I will sleep in death. He says, uh, Lord, give light to my eyes. Help me understand what's going on here. I want to understand this. Again, you may know what this feels like. You very well may be frustrated because you've been faithful to God in prayer. You may be, have been more tuned into church than what you were before because you see the need of it, and yet you're not getting the answer as to why, God, why? David knew how this felt. Even so much to say, or I'm going to die. I will sleep in death. If I don't get your help here, I'm just going to die. Verse 4, he goes on, he says, And my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. It's interesting uh, here, uh, before we get to verses 5 and 6, David says, God, do you understand my enemies are winning? And here I am being faithful to you. Don't you want to do something about this? This is really bad PR for you, God. In this moment, it's almost like David's trying to pressure God. God, you need to make sure you come close to me and make this all better because the enemies are looking like the winners here and I'm looking like the loser. That doesn't look good on you, God. David tries to almost manipulate God to try to get him to get active in this situation to take control, if you will, of God, to force his hand. I don't know how many of you have struggled with that, trying to pressure God to get what you want or you believe is best for your life. But as usual... With many of these psalms where David vents this frustration, where he vents hurt and wounding and not understanding God, he ends at a familiar place, starting in verse 5. And it starts with the word, but. Whenever you see that, that's really important. Now, I know the middle schoolers might be laughing because I said the word but right now, if they're watching right now. That probably got their attention. But uh, you get the idea. But is a turning point in this verse. It says, but I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. God, I trust in your unfailing love, he says. This is the turning point for him. This is when his mind goes from the depths of despair to hope in his salvation. He says, I'm going to trust in your loving kindness, God. Uh, this is the word that I've talked in the past about called chesed in the Hebrew, which is God's loyalty, loving kindness. It's his enduring promise to fulfill his promises to those that are his children, those that he loves, those that have a committed relationship with him. He will fulfill those promises. And David says, I'm just going to have to trust in this, your unfailing love for me as your child. He says, you know, my heart rejoices in your salvation. It shouts in triumph. It worships in this moment. Though I am frustrated, I will pour myself into worship. And I will sing the Lord's praise, for he has been good to me. May not feel like it right now, but if I look back on the past, there's been other times I've been about this bad or worse, and he's always been good to me. David was frustrated. David did not have control. David tried to pressure God a little bit by trying to be God's PR agent. 
But David in the very end remembered that God has been faithful. God promises salvation. God promises hope to those who are faithful to him. And he chose to trust that rather than the thoughts and the emotions that he was going through. What comes out in times of incredible stress and frustration like this is really what's inside of us. For some of us, if we were writing this psalm, we might have stopped after psalm, uh, verse 4. When he's done airing all his frustration and trying to manipulate God. We wouldn't have found it instinctive for us to go to, but I'm just going to trust you and worship you anyway. We would have stopped at verse 4. And that reveals what has been going on inside of us and where we are in our walk with God. That reveals how much we think we are in control or God is in control. Times of pressure and stress show us who we really are. Sometimes we have tried to force God to move with threats. And anytime we try to move God uh, with a threat or uh, a promise, you know, God, if you just let this happen, uh, I'll do this for you. When it doesn't turn out the way we want, we end up with no peace. No peace in our life. And I, God wants us to have peace in our life. Peace is not an absence of negative emotions. It is reminding them who is in control. Peace is not an absence of being scared or being fearful or worrying. It, 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 those things are still there, but it's keeping them in check with the truth about who is really in control. That is what brings peace. Even for me, I'll say in this time of tremendous uncertainty as to what's next for a ch our, our church or me personally or my kids or anything like that, I take peace in the fact that, yes, those emotions are there of worry or frustration, but God is in control. He is in control. He has promised that there's a purpose in this, and that I will put my hope in. And that... I used to silence the voices in me. Remind yourself that God is for you. You're his kid. You're his child. If you've committed your life to him, he's for you. He's fighting for you. He's working things out. Even if on the other end, they may not even look the exact same. They may be different, but he is working for you. In another psalm, David vents his frustrations uh, again, and, and I wanted to focus a little bit on this in Psalm 62 um, verses 5 through 8. David says, Yes, my soul find rest in God. My hope comes from Him. Truly, He is my rock, the thing that I can stand on and su it supports me. And my salvation, He's the one who's going to save me and bring me through this. He is my fortress. He's the one who gives me protection. I will not be shaken. My salvation and my honor depend on God. Literally, he says here, my reputation depends on how God works in this. He is my mighty rock and my refuge. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your hearts to him. For God is our refuge. Pour out your hearts to him. Find rest. Find rest. You hear this repeated in this, this uh, passage Finding rest is peace. It's finding stillness in this. And in the same time, we worship God and we pour our hearts out to him. We can tell him how we really feel, but it's also pouring out praises about his promises for you and for me. For some of you this morning, I have to challenge you to let go. Take time to be free of controlling everything. It's okay to not have to control everything. It's okay to not be in control. It's okay to just lay back, not to become apathetic, but just to say, all right, God, you're in control. I trust in you and I trust in your promises. I need you to get me through this. And that may be what the defining moment is for you today. I hope that this is the defining moment where we experience peace by giving up control of everything going on around us. We experience true peace from God, knowing he's in control. And we are no longer frustrated because we stop trying to control it. Stop trying to pressure God into changing things. We just trust him. We just wait for him to work it out. There's a boxing term that uh, I was reminded of this past week. It's called rope-a-dope. 
Now, if you don't know what rope-a-dope is, let me explain. When in a boxing match, a strategy that some boxers will use is they will put them, their back up against the ropes and they will cover their face and their chest like this. You've probably seen it if you've ever seen a clip of any kind of a boxing match. This does not happen in the Rocky movies because for some reason they keep their hands down just so they can get punched in the face. That's a whole other thing anyway. Uh, they do this and they get up against the ropes and the other boxer comes in and just starts wailing on the person. Pound, 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 pound. The strategy behind this is what's made famous by Muhammad Ali is that you do this, and yes, you're taking blows, you're taking punches off the arms, you're taking punches maybe on the side of the head, but it's not knocking you out. And what is happening is it's tiring out the other boxer. And when they are done, just they've thrown everything they can, you can drop your hands and you can go after them because they're worn out, and now they're going to have a hard time defending themselves. Which one are you in that boxing match when it comes to frustration or when it comes to trouble in your life? Are you the one that seeks to endure, to persevere, to put your, your arms up and just let it wail away, knowing that you're conserving your strength and you're going to pursue and persist through this and get through it and be successful on the other side? Or are you the boxer who's trying to wail out on the thing that's frustrating you and just wearing yourself thin and you have nothing left? You have no energy. And it knocks you down. Which one are you? I hope that we, in this moment, become the ones that will endure, that will not have to be in control of it, and that we have freedom in that, and God gives us his peace. Frustration with God uh, never moves him to change his plans. It's futile to try to think that we can pressure God into it or to be frustrated with him. It doesn't make him change and him go, wow, they're really frustrated. Maybe I should change how I'm handling things. That doesn't change it. But we do have a peace that God will help us endure. And there is another side to this long story of what we are going through. When you are free from control, this leads to your personal peace. You know God is working things out. You know you cannot thwart his plan. And you know God has a purpose in this. And it's for your good. So, what do you do in this time? Let me say this. Stop looking for things to control. Stop looking for things to plan. Maybe that gives you a little bit of hope about what you're going to do on the other side, but we really don't know what it looks like on the other side. Stop with the frustration of not being able to control everything in this. Trust in God. Stop trying to control the projects of your house. I'm not saying don't work on your house. I'm saying if that is your outlet so that you feel you're in control of something, it's unhealthy. It's unhealthy. My challenge for you this week is observe what you've been missing. Observe what you've been missing. Too often we're so busy doing things and being in control of things that we miss what is going on all around us. Uh, last year I read a book called Bored and Brilliant. I won't bore you with the details. Uh, I've mentioned it in the past, but... The author simply talks about the fact that sometimes it's good to be bored. When we're bored, our creativity goes through the roof. That's when we have our most productive moments is when we're bored. And also we slow down and we smell the roses, if you will. We begin to notice things around us that we didn't notice before and we find beauty in that. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Maybe you've started taking more walks during quarantine and you've noticed things you didn't notice before. Why don't we do this with life? Why don't we do this with our walk with God that we slow down? What's the rush? We can't go anywhere and we can't control it. So let's slow down and observe what's going on around us. Don't look for something to control while you're observing. Look for something to observe, to love, and to respect and enjoy. We want, uh, this past week I, I heard a quote. It was really good by a, a fellow pastor, Gavin Adams. He said, we want to get out of the wilderness, but God wants us to get something out of the wilderness. We oftentimes just want to get through this wilderness period, get out of it as quick as we can, but God wants us to get something out of it. What are you getting out of this? I want to end with prayer, and we have been doing the serenity prayer, the full serenity prayer, uh, because this just nails, I hope, the heart that we have all had during this time as we hopefully are preparing for things to begin to get back a little bit to normal in the next few weeks. 
I hope this becomes our prayer even beyond May 20th or June 20th or anything else that we have in the future. Let's pray together. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as the pathway to peace, taking, as he did, this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and ever in the next. And God, for those that are about to lose it because of ha uh, not having any ability to control the situation, may you come storming into their life and remove this frustration and help them say, or help them see, you got this. And they can trust you and slow down and not have to plan out everything or be in control of everything. That there's no need for frustration because you've got this. You're in control. And we can live in that freedom. God, give freedom from bondage of having to be in control of every detail of our life or detail of our family's lives or our spouse's lives or our kids' lives. God, may we trust you and find freedom and your care for us. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that's it. Thank you so much for coming today. Before you leave, I just have a couple of quick announcements. First of all, if you would like to give to Hope Church, if Hope Church is your church and you want to give to keep supporting the ministry of Hope, you can do that in a couple really quick ways. First of all, you could click the link right on this page. That's the easiest way. Second, you could text your gift to 84321. Or finally, uh, you can go to our app or online at cthope.com, click the Give tab, and uh, we would really appreciate your support during uh, this time. Uh, we are here every week at 10 a.m. and 6 p.m. Share it with a friend. Uh, once this is over, uh, it's available on YouTube, on Vimeo, and on Facebook, so lots of ways that you can get that word out if you've been blessed uh, this morning. Thank you so much for joining us. We are going to see you soon. God bless.